Bom dia, bem-vindos ao terceiro webinar da série de comemoração dos 20 anos do programa Iota FAPESP. Esse webinar terá como foco os projetos desenvolvidos na área de bioprospecção que compõem um subprograma do programa Biota, que é o Bioprospecta. É, nós teremos três informações, é, três, três apresentações é, seguidas, a apresentação das professoras uh, Vanderla e Letícia, que vão falar sobre uh, os avanços que o Biota fez nessa área. Depois nós teremos a apresentação do nosso convidado uh, Barry O'Keefe, uh, do National Cancer Institute dos Estados Unidos, comanda o programa de uh, química de produtos naturais nessa instituição. E depois nós teremos a apresentação uh, do Uh, Iguatemi, uh, que uh, é uh, pesquisador e uh, diretor de laboratório de pesquisa na Natura, que vai estar apresentando uh, como uh, as pesquisas feitas na área de bioprospecção são aproveitadas pelo setor produtivo. Se vocês tiverem perguntas durante o webinar, por favor, mandem as perguntas para o e-mail contato arroba biota.org.br e a equipe de apoio vai estar uh, criando essas perguntas, organizando ela e depois repassando para que eu as apresente ao final das três apresentações. Welcome all. Uh, we will start now the third webinar on the series of webinars the Programa Biota has organized in commemoration of its uh, 20 year. This webinar will be focusing on bioprospection, and this is a, a sub-program of the Biota program, as is called uh, Bioprospecta. Uh, and this is the, the large umbrella that uh, takes up all the programs, all the projects that are looking for molecules of potential economical interest. We are going to have three presentations. Uh, the first one by Professors uh, van der Leyen and Leticia. Uh, they will present the advances uh, the Biota program made in this area of research. Then we are going to have the presentation of uh, Dr. Barry O'Keefe from the National Cancer Institute. And he will be talking about the natural product program in that institution. And then we have the presentation of Iguatemi Costa that works at Natura. Natura is a cosmetic uh, company. Uh, and he will talk about how this research is used uh, in production of uh, new cosmetics. So uh, let's restart with uh, Professor van der Leer presenting the uh, advances of the Biota program in this area. Professor Van der you have the floor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jolie, for this presentation. I am so glad to be here today uh, to celebrate 20 years of this wonderful program. Uh, I have been in Campinas when biologists discuss this program. And so my, uh, I think my relationship with biot is a question of love. Uh, I will talk in Portuguese and my presentation will be in English. I think uh, I can manage uh, this. And uh, I will try to speak today about the impacts and current development of research that you have done in this beautiful and magnificent program. The next. Oh. oh. Uh, 
Esta é uma foto histórica que eu gostaria de... Não poderia deixar de não apresentar neste momento, que foi quando nós começamos o Biota Programa. É, naquela época não existia Bioprospecta, o Biota começou né, no, em 99, e nós... É, com essa coordenação, que era uma coordenação, um grupo grande que nos reuníamos. Mas o mais importante que eu vejo aqui é a foto de discussão do bioprospecta dentro do Biota. Éramos todos muito jovens, como podem ver aí, <risos> Jolie, um garoto, Glaucio Oliva, e todo um time que discutia. E o mais interessante é que, naquela época, o diretor científico da FAPESP, era o Fernando Pérez, que tinha um olhar muito especial para as questões da biodiversidade e também produtos naturais, e um dos seus dos coordenadores da diretoria científica naquela época, o Luiz Melo, hoje diretor científico da FAPESP, e não podia deixar de mencionar aqui a Sônia Dietrich, que foi uma grande cientista da área da biologia, do Instituto de Botânica, e foi graças a ela que eu cheguei ao Biota FAPESP. Próxima. A minha apresentação hoje, eu vou falar alguns aspectos da biodiversidade que são importantes para a área que nós fazemos, alguns exemplos, algumas considerações finais, e depois eu vou passar a palavra para a Letícia Lotufo, que faz parte do grupo de coordenação na área de bioprospecta, para falar dos projetos nesses anos que estão em andamento e que fizeram sucesso. A próxima. Eu gosto dessa, desse slide porque ele mostra a importância da biodiversidade, mas mais do que isso, a fotossíntese, que é responsável por tudo que nós temos na vida que se relaciona a reação da energia solar quando em contato com as, as plantas e as espécies do planeta formam esse arcabouço de reações fantásticas que são responsáveis por tudo que nós temos e que nós usamos no dia a dia de uma sociedade moderna. A próxima. Logicamente, tudo isto, essa, essa, essa quantidade de reações bioquímicas que acontecem nos organismos da biodiversidade, elas têm uma resposta, e essa resposta é química, que é essa diversidade molecular incrível e que ela é responsável elas são biologicamente ativas. A natureza não fez nada para o homem. A natureza produz essa riqueza fascinante para a sua regulação, para a sua adaptação, para a sua interação planta-planta, planta-inseto, inseto-inseto. Então, esse conjunto bioquímico fascinante é mediado por micromoléculas ou produtos naturais de grande sofisticação e que, neste momento de 20 anos do Biota, nós celebramos o centenário do professor Otto Gottlieb, que foi um apaixonado pela natureza e um químico de produtos naturais indicado três vezes para o Nobel. E ele gostava de mencionar essa frase. Cada planta contém centenas de compostos e uma delas pode ser mais importante do que uma galáxia. A próxima. Uh, um outro aspecto da biodiversidade, mais para o lado do que nós estamos tentando introduzir com o subprograma Bioprospecta, é valorização dessa biodiversidade. Eu gosto muito do livro e dos comentários de um grande cientista, que é o Eduardo Wilson, e que ele coloca tão bem essa dimensão da biodiversidade, não apenas de gerar conhecimento novo, principalmente no Brasil, onde nós temos os ambientes, as florestas equatoriais, e que nós muito pouco conhecemos. Então, fornecer conhecimento novo, 
E, logicamente, conhecimento novo de excelência poderia gerar também tecnologia que são essenciais para o desenvolvimento econômico e melhoria da qualidade de vida humana. Assim, a natureza produz uma série de bens. O primeiro deles é o conhecimento, que esse não tem, é imesurável, e os demais que são úteis para a nossa manutenção na Terra. A próxima. Eu gosto desse, dessa linha do tempo, fiz isso por uma apresentação que eu fiz, porque mostra aqui alguns produtos naturais que mudaram a história da humanidade. A maioria deles vocês conhecem, quando começa, que eu sou apaixonada pela morfina, porque a morfina, 3 mil anos antes de Cristo, até hoje, ainda é um analgésico para dores crônicas e algumas dores terminais, mesmo que nós tenhamos é, alguns analgésicos tão sofisticados quanto esse peptídeo que está aí, que foi descoberto em 2004, mas que são muito caros e ainda não é acessível a todos. E eu gostaria de mencionar, muito recentemente, que é o Epidolex, que é um produto agora oficial, é, cadastrado no FDA pelo, a partir de cannabis, como vocês sabem, muito útil, principalmente para as crianças que têm algumas desordens neurológicas. A próxima. Todos sabem, isso aqui é recorrente, de que nós temos muitos biomas, nesses biomas muito pouca coisa estudada, logicamente que atualmente, com os avanços tecnológicos, principalmente os avanços nas metodologias de análise, é possível dominar os famosos estudos ômicos, porque nós podemos usar ferramentas moleculares e espectrometrias de massa e ressonância para fazer mapeamento, e com isso o Brasil, com essa diversidade enorme, torna-se um ambiente maravilhoso para se fazer biodescoberta. A próxima. Apenas alguns comentários adicionais de, da importância dos produtos naturais. Eu vou destacar aqui duas. As arquiteturas moleculares que a natureza produz, por mais brilhante que o homem consiga ser ou chegar a prêmio Nobel, jamais conseguiu imaginar ou fazer no seu laboratório estruturas tão sofisticadas. Então, a natureza é um exemplo e um modelo para que nós possamos cada dia mais entendê-la e, ao prospectá-la, verificar modelos novos e, assim, podermos avançar principalmente na química e na síntese orgânica. Outra coisa também importante, porque esses modelos são fundamentais para o avanço da química medicinal, que aí nós estamos usando do ponto de vista farmacológico em busca de novos medicamentos, principalmente no momento como o nosso, de uma pandemia, de uma crise sanitária sem precedentes, onde não temos absolutamente nenhum medicamento. Quem sabe, a partir daqui, nós possamos estudar e descobrir alguma coisa da natureza. A próxima. Esse é o momento que eu fico um pouco emocionada, porque eu participo deste programa, como eu já falei no início, desde o começo, e, logicamente, o Jolie, que foi quem começou idealizou e é uma grande inspiração para todos nós, mas não poderíamos deixar de mencionar aqui duas pessoas que foram muito importantes no momento da criação do Bioprospecta e que vieram várias vezes aqui avaliar o programa. O professor Gordon Craig, que todos conhecem, e o professor Rob Veport, são dois cientistas adoráveis e adoram o Brasil e fizeram um relatório maravilhoso e isso nos deu força de continuar fazendo o programa e criando esse subprograma na FAPESP, o Bioprospecto. A próxima. Logicamente, esse esquema aqui mostra a importância da biodescoberta não apenas do ponto de vista de você entender a biodiversidade do seu sistema endêmico como todas as propriedades dos organismos, que isso é conhecimento novo, mas de que esse conhecimento 
ao, associado aos conhecimentos tradicionais, possam trazer benefício social e econômico, e é essa a essência da biodescoberta e o que nós é, idealizamos, e é o nosso sonho que um dia o biota, como o Jolie sempre falou, que possa ter valor agregado oriundo de nossa natureza. A próxima. Um outro é, aspecto importante da biodiversidade e que está tanto em moda hoje são os serviços ecossistêmicos. E eles passam naturalmente por uma série de processos que vai da biologia a todo o aspecto da biologia, que é uma área muito ampla, mas também da química, também da antropologia. Então, todas essas áreas juntas elas produzem os sistemas ecossistêmicos que são fundamentais nesse momento para um país como o Brasil, que tem tudo a construir e com uma riqueza enorme, mas muito dessa riqueza sendo devastada pelas enormes queimadas e pela agricultura improcedente na destruição das florestas. Então, o serviço ecossistêmico mostra como a natureza pode contribuir para o avanço econômico e social de um país. A próxima. Isso aqui foi uma, uma linha do tempo traçada. Quem fez esse trabalho lindo e minucioso foi a Letícia, nessa semana, de conseguir colocar todos os projetos que foram submetidos e o que estão em andamento dentro do subprograma Bioprospecta no Biota FAPESP. Ao todo foram 49 projetos, nós temos 13 projetos em andamento, e o que eu acho que é mais importante ressaltar aqui são projetos de grande, de grande duração, que são extremamente importantes na linha de, de fomento da pesquisa na FAPESP, que foram ao todo 21 projetos, nesse tempo, desde o início até agora, nós, nosso grupo de pesquisa, todos são projetos temáticos, mas destacar principalmente os projetos regulares, que são, em geral, de pessoas que estão iniciando, são jovens, e que também é muito importante para desenvolver a ciência no país. A próxima. Então, agora nós temos aqui o uma produção, a produção científica que foi feita neste momento, e nós vamos apresentá-la. Próxima. É uma produção científica, como é de se esperar, num país como o Brasil, tem uma produção de publicações em jornais especializados expressiva, isso é importante, isso mostra a nossa participação no mundo internacional científico. No entanto, o número de patentes oriundas ainda é muito pequeno, os PCTs, que são as patentes submetidas no cenário internacional, menor ainda, e licenciadas, que são aquelas onde as empresas absorvem e começam a, a suportar essas patentes, menor ainda, e as parcerias muito pequenas. Então, este é um gráfico que eu acho que nós é mostrado para que nós possamos ter uma noção de futuro e de perspectiva e pensar como agir, como trabalhar para que a ciência de qualidade do nosso país possa também produzir aquilo que o setor industrial pode absorver. A próxima. Aqui, apenas para citar um exemplo do grupo que eu participo, Esse, como falei, o Instituto de Química da Unesp de Araraquara tem um componente, de, tem, vários, tem um grupo grande na química de produtos naturais, desde o início participa do Biota e FAPESP, e o que foi mais importante que o Biota, ele, nós conseguimos a estrutura para entrar num grande Programa FAPESP, que são os CEPIDES, programas de longa duração, e logo em seguida entrar no cenário nacional com os INCTs, que são os projetos CNPq. E por que eu destaco aqui os INCTs e o Biota? Porque o Biota foi como um catalisador para que nós pudéssemos entrar no INCT 
com vários jovens espalhados nesse Brasil inteiro e ter o primeiro projeto de produtos naturais de grande dimensão nacional dentro do CNPq. A próxima. Esse é o Instituto, mostrando na realidade a sua dimensão, principalmente estamos radicados na região sudeste, em São Paulo, mas é importante destacar que nós temos um pé na Amazônia, um três pés no Nordeste e um pé no Rio Grande do Sul, então uma amplitude no país, todos com pessoas muito jovens, isso é extremamente importante, e esse projeto cuja produção está aqui, o mais importante é que nós temos alguns PCTs e, recentemente, um licenciamento com a empresa alemã, e isso é extremamente importante. A próxima. Um outro dado importante que eu acho que é o produto de maior valor agregado da nossa biodiversidade é a criação de uma base de dados. Isso era meu sonho, começamos com o número de produtos naturais do, bio, do, do nosso laboratório, visando, se você tem essa informação organizada, você é capaz de fornecer dados para estudos de metabolômica, de, principalmente ecologia química, biossíntese, e com isso nós criamos coragem de investir numa base de dados de produtos naturais, não só de São Paulo, mas do Brasil. A próxima. Esse, esse, esse início, mesmo com 600 substâncias, fez um impacto enorme, e quando eu vi que o ICBG publicou nas, nos artigos de destaque a base de dados de 600 produtos publicada em 2013, fiquei muito feliz, e aquilo foi um grande incentivo para que nós continuássemos. A próxima. A mesma coisa aconteceu com o Nature Reviews, em 2015, dentre as bases de dados mais famosas do mundo, cita-se o NUB com 640 substâncias. Aí eu comecei a trabalhar nisso para verificar como nós poderíamos organizar essa informação de modo a ela se tornar a primeira base de dados organizada deste país. A próxima. Essa é o cenário atual. Nós tivemos uma grande satisfação que o Chemical Abstract, que é a maior base de dados químicos do mundo, sediada em Ohio, nos convidou. Nós fizemos um contrato, um memorando, e eles serão capazes de estudar e, de, e conseguiram verificar que da biodiversidade brasileira tem registrado no Chemical Abstract 54.200 compostos e nós podemos absorver esses compostos para que nós possamos ter a base de dados de produtos naturais do Brasil, que eu acho que seria o sonho não só de quem é químico, mas de biólogo, antropólogo, porque nós temos toda a informação organizada e isso poderia ter acontecido em maio, mas veio a pandemia, nós imaginamos que no próximo ano nós poderemos estar com esses dados todos organizados. Então, isso eu acho que, é um, para mim, é o maior presente que eu poderia dar para um programa que eu tenho a questão de amor. A próxima. Agora passo a palavra para a Letícia, que ela vai colocar os exemplos de todos os projetos que estão em andamento no Biota. São lindos, diversos, e complementa e fazem com que o subprograma ele seja um subprograma robusto, à altura do que significa o Biota para São Paulo, para o país e para o mundo. Muito obrigada. Eu agradeço a todos é, a oportunidade de estar aqui falando. É, na verdade, a tarefa de escolher esses projetos foi árdua. É, e nós acabamos por optar por aqueles projetos que foram aprovados e estão em andamento nos últimos anos, na tentativa de mostrar um cenário mais contemporâneo do que é está que acontecendo dentro do Biota agora, com vários projetos já bem amadurecidos e que é, vão trazer um pouco assim, um panorama geral 
daquilo que, que a gente tem em andamento. É, esse primeiro projeto que a gente vai mostrar para vocês é um projeto do professor Norberto Peporini Lopes, da Faculdade de Ciências Farmacêuticas de Ribeirão. Eu vou, vou ser rápida na apresentação, mas é um projeto com uma publicação bastante expressiva. Nós temos uma atuação também de divulgação científica também é, bem importante em vários canais, como vocês podem ver, em vários países. E, na verdade, é o objetivo do professor Norberto começa com estudar o metabolismo de produtos naturais e tentar trazer né, novas formas da gente avaliar a farmacocinética e contribuir com a compreensão né, de, desse, da atividade biológica desses produtos naturais, mas eu acho que ele, que ele traz para a gente muito mais, porque ele acabou incorporando não só produtos naturais de plantas, mas ele traz modelos, como, por exemplo, vocês podem ver aqui né, a RAM, que ele descobriu moléculas fluorescentes. Então, assim, ele, ele, ele conseguiu permear todas, eu acho que todos os, os, os filos e mostrar como a espectrometria de massas pode se aplicar no estudo desses produtos naturais. É... Outro um ponto importante do projeto que a gente tentou mostrar aqui é como que o impacto de pesquisa, ou seja, alguns papers né, que foram publicados, se traduziram, por exemplo, em patentes né, ou, no, em alguns casos, em cooperações, por exemplo, com a indústria de cosméticos, cooperações com a indústria de agricultura, mostrando que, sim, é possível, a partir dessa geração de conhecimento básico, fazer a translação com a aplicação né, na, na, no setor industrial. O segundo projeto que a gente tem em andamento é o projeto do professor João Lago, que dá na Federal do ABC, né, que estuda plantas da floresta atlântica e do cerrado, aqui com foco principalmente no, no tratamento de doenças é, tropicais ne negligenciadas, também com a produção expressiva, né, todos eles têm essa mesma característica, e aqui a gente pode ver que o professor João Lago ele aborda mais questões como doença de chagas, como leishmania, trazendo, então, qual seria o nosso potencial né, no tratamento dessas doenças. Um outro projeto que eu julgo bastante interessante aqui para mostrar para vocês é o projeto coordenado pelo professor Massucato, do Instituto de Química da USP. Nesse caso, em específico, a gente tem o, como que... As, as pistas químicas podem né, é, contribuir, eu diria que no processo evolutivo, ou seja, é, o professor Massucato tem uma experiência de 20 anos no estudo de plantas da família Piperácea e incorporando agora a ideia do, de como as relações de herbivoria e de parasitas é, fazem um drive da evolução dessas espécies conjuntamente, o professor Massu, então, tem estudado como essa, essa, essa inter-relação né, ecológica se traduz numa diversidade química, especificamente estudando plantas do gênero piper e é, borboletas né, do gênero elways. Esse projeto do professor Massu, ele traz um componente que eu julgo bastante interessante, porque é um projeto em... É, colaboração, né, é um joint venture da FAPESP com a National Science Foundation, num projeto que é, num programa que a National Science Foundation tem, que chama Dimensions of Diversity. Então, mostra né, que a, a, as parcerias internacionais também fortalecem muito, no caso né, é, do, do desenvolvimento desses projetos. Então, aqui a gente pode ver vários trabalhos que foram publicados a partir dessa parceria, em seguida, nós temos o trabalho da Patrícia Pauletti, que está na Universidade de Franca, onde também ela estuda plantas né, da, da melastomatáceas e tem avaliado atividades como, por exemplo, é antiplasmódio, né, no tratamento da malária. Um outro é, projeto bastante interessante, a professora Vanderlan mencionou para vocês o programa ICBG, né, que infelizmente foi recentemente descontinuado, a professora Mônica Pulpo tem, é, ela coordena o único ICBG que foi aprovado no Brasil, numa parceria com o professor John Plard, que é da Harvard Med Medical School, e esse projeto da professora Mônica, ele também traz a questão da ecologia química como central, né? e é, é muito interessante de ver 
por exemplo, que a professora Mônica ela mostra né, que a gente tem é, insetos onde bactérias associadas podem produzir né, precursores essenciais de substâncias que depois vão é, levar a nossa, a, 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 as abelhas ao a metamorfose. Então, isso é um, é um interessante a gente entender como é que essa conversa né, entre microbiota e o host acontece e, perdão, a gente tem, a partir daqui, né, também das, das bactérias isoladas, a descoberta de novas entidades químicas. E nesse projeto de, de, com formigas, a professora Mônica isola uma substância que, na verdade, foi recentemente patenteada, é um dos PCTs do nosso, do nosso, apresentado pela Vanderlan, com, por sua potente atividade antifúngica. Né? A gente tem também os trabalhos do professor Mário Palma, da Unesp, mostrando, então, ele, primeiramente o desenvolvimento de um soro antipicada de abelha, e mais recentemente o professor Mário Palma traz o estudo de, do que ele chama de venômica, né, na tentativa de compreender a diversidade química dos venenos de artrópoda e como isso pode ser traduzido num potencial biotecnológico. O professor Roberto Berlim, que é um dos pioneiros no estudo de produtos naturais marinhos, é, aqui na, no, no litoral de São Paulo, ele traz, né, ele vem acumulando é, conhecimento na diversidade química, não só dos invertebrados, mas mais recentemente dos micro-organismos associados, e trazendo não só a ideia de entender como esses, esses produtos marinhos podem agregar valor de atividade biológica, mas também contribuindo para o entendimento da biossíntese e da, 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 do conhecimento mais amplo né, no sentido da nossa biodiversidade marinha. O professor Pio Colepículo também tem vários projetos no Biótica, e esse especificamente em andamento, estudando a diversidade de algas, e eu queria só ressaltar que o professor Pio ele tem uma preocupação muito grande de trabalhar junto à comunidade no sentido de desenvolver estratégias de cultivo das algas para que aquele, a, a comercialização desse, dessa, desse recurso seja algo sustentável e que envolva também as comunidades locais né, de é, coletoras dessas algas. Ressaltando aqui, ele tem um trabalho fantástico com diversidade de carotenos, onde a gente pode ver né, o, o mercado de carotenoides no mundo é um mercado dominado principalmente pelas moléculas sintéticas, mas é um mercado bilionário. E ele traz também uma parceria com a Natura, da, 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 do isolamento de micosporinas, que são moléculas que podem proteger da radiação UV e que estariam relacionadas ao desenvolvimento de protetores solares mais ambientalmente é, sustentáveis, né, amigáveis. Aqui o trabalho da professora Eliana Nagana do Butantan, que traz diversidade também é, de algas e produtos isolados e a modificação e o desenho racional dessas moléculas isoladas. E, por fim, um braço que é interessantíssimo do, do que tem sido agregado ao, ao biota é a ideia do entendimento de como as comunidades tradicionais usam a nossa diversidade. Aqui o trabalho da professora Eliana Rodrigues, da Unesp, mostrando com, na, no Amazonas, com comunidades né, do Rio Unimi, e mais recentemente ela tem projetos aqui com as comunidades quilombolas em é, Pincinguaba, Ubatuba, e ela tem produzido uma série de materiais, entre esses é, livretos, é, filmes, no sentido de mostrar esse conhecimento tradicional associado, que é tão importante para o entendimento e, muitas vezes, da pesquisa de base da nossa biodiversidade. Então, com isso, nós chegamos ao final da nossa apresentação. Eu quero convidar a professora Vanderlan Bozani para fazer essas últimas considerações. Por favor, Wanda, ligar o vídeo. Ok. Ah... Eu agradeço a Letícia pela sua excelente apresentação, mostrando a importância do nosso, do nosso trabalho é, ao longo desse tempo dentro do programa Biota. E, com isso, 
mostrar a, o que, que nós fazemos, mas, principalmente, o que, que eu acho que nós podemos fazer de conclusão nestes 18 anos de Bioprospecta. Eu continuo é, é, otimista de que um país que detém uma das maiores biodiversidades do mundo, né, é, a informação química, não apenas para levar a novos protótipos para desenvolvimento de fármacos, cosméticos, suplementos alimentares, mas principalmente para nós podermos entender a natureza na sua essência molecular e com ela nós projetarmos e pensarmos estudo de proteção ambiental, estudos de ecologia química, estudos que possam trazer benefícios para aumentar o conhecimento desses ambientes ainda pouco estudados. Né? Um outro programa com, relacionado à biodescoberta de ambientes tropicais, onde nós vamos conhecer uma quantidade enorme de tipos estruturais que podem ser extremamente úteis como modelo para a química medicinal, isso também é uma coisa maravilhosa, e principalmente para a síntese orgânica, como eu falei anteriormente, a química orgânica foi sempre inspirada na natureza. O que eu destaco aqui é que os projetos de, de, longo, de longa duração são essenciais para que nós possamos aumentar o conhecimento científico e pensar em desenvolvimento, que não é feito pelas as universidades e institutos de pesquisa, mas pelo setor industrial, de absorver esse conhecimento. Então, isso é extremamente importante. Eu acho que o Biota e o Bioprospecta, nesse tempo, con, con, conseguiu é, construir um ambiente científico de muitos cientistas, principalmente de jovens pesquisadores, isso é extremamente importante. A próxima. A próxima. A próxima, Letícia. E agora, pra, realmente, só finalizando mesmo, eu acho que os nossos desafios para a próxima fase é ser mais impactante com o setor né, de negócios, não é uma tarefa simples, porque não é uma tarefa de pesquisador, mas nós podemos contribuir muito, e é aumentar as colaborações principalmente aquelas colaborações entre as áreas que são mais atrativas para alguns setores empresariais, né? principalmente a área de cosméticos, que é uma área mais simples, porque não precisa de muito desenvolvimento radical. A área de fármacos é complicada, mas também faz parte, eu acho, que do nosso sonho que está nesse programa. E, finalizando, eu gosto muito desse cartoon, onde mostra que essa, esse paradigma que existe de dois mundos tão diferentes, que é o mundo do negócio e o mundo acadêmico, mas que eu acho que nós podemos combiná-lo, porque se nós temos o conhecimento acadêmico e a liberdade de pensar, nós somos capazes de fazer colaborações com quem produz riqueza econômica, para que nós possamos continuar sendo extremamente produtivos. Então, essa é a minha, é a minha apresentação final de conclusões do, bio, do, bio, do Bioprospecta dentro do Biota, que eu acho que é extremamente importante, eu gostaria de agradecer, mas eu gostaria de ler, se me permitem, a frase do Theodore Roosevelt, que foi presidente dos Estados Unidos, que eu acho que cabe muito neste momento aqui. Here is your country. Cherish these natural wonders. Cherish this natural resource. Cherish the history and romance as a sacred heritage for your children and your children's children. Do not let selfish men or greed interest skin your country of its built, its riches or It's a romance. Thank you very much. É, muito obrigado, professoras Vanderlã e Letícia, é, por essa é, apresentação. 
É, eu queria aproveitar esta oportunidade para informar a todos aqueles que estão nos acompanhando pelo YouTube e, e todos os colegas é, pesquisadores da área de bioprospecção que, desde a, o início de agosto, a professora Letícia Lotufo, do Instituto de Ciências Biomédicas é, da Universidade de São Paulo, substituiu o professor Roberto Berlink na coordenação do programa BIOT. Portanto, é, desde o início de agosto, a Letícia faz parte da coordenação do BIOT. Thank you, Vanderlan and uh, Letícia, for this presentation. Uh, I think uh, it was a very good summary of what has been produced uh, by the bioprospection uh, area in the Biota program. And as I said in Portuguese, uh, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Letícia Lutufu as a new member of the, the steering committee of the Biota program. Uh, since early August, she's been She's replaced uh, Professor Roberto Berlinki and now is uh, a member of the steering committee. Uh, without further delay, uh, I will ask uh, Professor Barry uh, Cherno uh, if, uh, for him to present his uh, talk on the NCII program for natural product discovery. Professor Barry, the floor is with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me make sure you can see my slides. Hopefully they are visible to everyone. Uh, I'll do my best to follow that amazing presentation uh, and let you know a few new things we're doing here at the National Cancer Institute. Um, to start, uh, a quick outline of my presentation. Uh, you know, why are we at the NCI interested in natural products, uh, some of the challenges for using natural products and drug discovery pipelines, and then a little bit about the NCI natural product extract repository, and then most of the talk will discuss the NCI program for natural product discovery, which is a new initiative that started just a couple of years ago to try and improve the prospects for natural product drug discovery here in the United States and around the world. So first, uh, we all take great pride, uh, natural products chemists and researchers, in the discovery of new agents that make a difference in human health. You see several of them here. These are just uh, from about a five-year time period of the ones I'm describing. Uh, recent anti-cancer mostly, but a couple of things for type 2 diabetes or an antibiotic. So I think we rightly take uh, pride in this. Uh, my predecessors in the natural products branch, Drs. Craig and Newman, published their reviews regularly, which I'm sure some of you are quite familiar with from the number of times they've been cited. Um, but they show that generally, if we look approximately 30% overall of all new small molecule drugs come from natural products or are derived from natural products um, by semi-synthetic methods. So this is an important part, clearly, of the current pharmacopoeia that we use around the world. However, if we take a look at the amount of natural products in current screening programs, it's a much less, um, it's much less something to be proud about. This is a graph from a review that I and my colleagues published just this year, looking at the number of papers that are published every year in high throughput screening and then looking at the percent of those that actually screen natural products. As you can see, there was a significant increase in the uh, high throughput screening, which is sort of leveled out at about 2000 papers a year since about 2013. However, if you look at the very tiny areas in red at the bottom of these bar graphs, those are the number of papers that actually involve natural products. And so we can see that the vast majority of high throughput screens looking for drug discovery that are published every year do not involve natural products at all. And that's a problem for our field. And that's something we have to figure out a way to address. Because if people are not actually testing our natural products, how will we find those new and interesting activities um, that were mentioned in the previous talk? So, why is this so? Well, there are some challenges to screening natural products. For example, 
Crude extracts have a lot of complications to them when you put them in standard assay systems in a modern high throughput screening environment. There is cytotoxicity that complicates cell-based reporter assay systems. There are also common nuisance compounds such as tannins that complicate cell-free assay systems by aggregating enzymes or reagents in those systems. And then we often need secondary and tertiary assay systems to prioritize the extracts, which commonly provide higher hit rates than are seen from pure compound libraries. In addition, each extract contains numerous individual compounds um, of different concentrations, which are unknown. So this often puts the screener in a position of selecting an appropriate test concentration, which can be a trade-off between sensitivity and high hit rates. And this can be problematic. For example, if we decide that if we test at 50 micrograms per mil of a crude extract, uh, but then we get a hit rate that's 15% of those tested samples, that's far too high. And the screeners won't accept that and we don't have enough people to work those up generally. But if we go down and say test at 10 micrograms per mil of a crude extract, to find something that's going to be a one micromolar inhibitor in a standard assay, that compound has to be approximately 5% of the total mass of that crude extract. So what type of chemistry can you find from that? That's gonna be known chemistry. These are not gonna be the type of molecules that we really desire to find from our screens. And so those trade-offs make it very difficult. Also, the purification structural characterization of active compounds is time consuming historically and doesn't mesh well with current HTS screening protocols. When you're working with a high throughput screening lab that can screen 100,000 samples a week, but yet your low throughput bioassay guided fractionation procedures are only producing 30 to maybe 100 compounds every week or two, and that this continues for a period of months or even years, keeping all of those fixed costs for that screen up and running to support that low level of natural products chemistry is problematic um, on a cost relation basis. So if we're, if we're looking at ways, as Vanderlyn mentioned in her closing slide, of ways to integrate with industry more fruitfully, we can't use methodologies that are going to increase their cost significantly just for including natural products. And if you need a picture worth a thousand words. Here's an example. This is plates of natural product extracts, crudes. And you can see they're colored, they're viscous, uh, they're a variety of things. Now, there are ways to work through these issues with screening. Uh, as I mentioned in the review that we published just this year, we go through in detail a lot of the methods for optimizing screens for use with natural products. What you see on the graph here is a depiction of two screens, the same exact target, but one screen was optimized for natural products by making changes in buffers, and looking at different optimized times for the assay. And what you can see is that we screen the same exact library in a standard kinase assay as run in industry or most pure compound screens. We see a hit rate of approximately 40% with this challenge set of extracts, which is unacceptable and not workable for industry. However, if we optimize that assay with a variety of methodologies described in that paper, we see we can get that hit rate down below 1% as anything falling below the 50% line is considered a hit in this assay, you can see the significantly reduced number of things in the green assay that has been optimized for natural products as compared to the red assay, which is a standard kinase assay as used in industry. So this is one way to help improve natural products and improve the screening thereof. What else can we do? Well, if we take a look at this, just recent uh, cover of the Journal of Organic Chemistry, we can see that nature is still the best chemist um, and can make significant molecules that affect health and disease and also industries and the livelihood of people as well, better than we humans can devise on our own. So we still have over 40% of clinically used anti-cancer chemotherapeutics from natural products but less than 1% of the high throughput screening is going on with natural products. That's not sustainable. So natural product crude extract libraries are underutilized 
how to do that. We at the NCI have a significant natural products repository of crude extracts. We have to get a methodology in place to get past these screening challenges, improve these costs and, of and time involved with isolation and structural elucidation and improve chances for resupply if we're going to integrate more fully and continue working with natural products in the future. So just as a bit of background, the NCI natural product collections of the um, natural products branch here, we have one of the world's largest, most diverse collections, uh, over 230,000 extracts currently. Uh, you see the breakdown on the right-hand side of the slide, uh, those from plants uh, responsible for 161,000 of the extracts. Uh, marine extracts about 41,000 and microbial extracts about 30,000. I will say these numbers continue to increase. At this point, we have approximately an additional 20,000 microbial organisms that have been added recently and an additional about 8,000 uh, marine organisms that also were added, which will be creating extracts and added to the library in the not too distant future. So the NCI has a big library of crude extracts, but people don't want to screen them. So how can we get to that next level? Well, the NCI was able to, we were able to propose and get approved the NCI program for natural product discovery, which is a collaboration between two different branches of the National Cancer Institute. And it's designed to facilitate both intramural and extramural. So both work at the NCI and in the greater research community and address the current challenges in natural product-based drug discovery. And this was funded by the Cancer Moonshot Program here in the United States for a period of five years. And what is the scope of this program? Well, it includes everything from the collection and extraction, prefractionation, high throughput screening, compound isolation, structural elucidation, compound resupply, chemical genomics and bioinformatics. Um, it's an ambitious program. The idea is that we will encourage partnerships, both intramurally, extramurally with pharma to participate in this, and that we would create new technologies that would change the way natural product research is performed. So the goal is kind of like you see here, to go from the production line that we see on the left-hand side of the slide to something more modern, like we see on the right-hand side. It is not uh, a uh, insignificant challenge. So what are the goals? Well, initially we were go are going to create a library of 1 million partially purified fractions, uh, natural products that are more amenable to modern screening campaigns. Uh, this library then will be provided to the research community for free for screening against any disease state. And we would then be able to use this prefractionated library to improve the efficiency of both high throughput screening and subsequent chemistry efforts. Now there's some practical considerations. We were supposed to make this in five years. So we needed to produce greater than 150,000 fractions per year. We needed all the fractions to have a defined weight. So all of them must be weighed. Uh, the goal was to have sufficient mass to support 20 screens a year for 10 years at a minimum. And we must have storage that will allow for rapid automated access because we can't send someone into a freezer to find the three tubes out of a million that we would like to use for second stage purifications. So we set about to do this. The first thing we had to do was to optimize method development. We looked at a variety of plant, marine, and microbial extracts, both organic and aqueous. We put them through a mix of a variety of different extraction procedures um, for both the aqueous and organic. We looked at different uh, strategies for solvent partitions and also for the steps in our gradient, either seven or 10. Um, and we ended up with creating as a pilot about 2000 individual fractions. We then tested these in biochemical assays, the NZI-60 assay and a high content imaging assay to see how they performed in comparison to crude extracts. We then tested each mass each fraction was also dried and weighed for mass. We looked at the percent of phenolics in each and we also looked at the total yield as compared to the material put in. And then finally, we analyzed them by LCMSMS and did principal component analysis. A little of that data is shown here on this slide. 
you can see for a particular one of the organisms, we show the mass distribution. In this case, we show eight different types of purification procedures that were used, and we took seven fractions each. This does not include those we did with 10 fractions with this organism. And if we take a look at the bioassay data below in the NCI-60 assay, you see fraction five is highlighted in red as it is the most potently cytotoxic of the fractions shown. And you can see also that the crude extract is shown. On the left, you would not see any activity in the crude extract if you tested the crude extract at the same test concentration. However, fraction five does show cytotoxicity which is indicated by the bar graph moving farther to the right, the individual bars. On the right-hand side, you see principal component analysis and testing for both tannins and cytotoxicity assay. And what you can see is we can show that the threshold for activity, again, fraction five is the most potent, but it does not include tannins. And what we did with the principal component analysis was look at the variety of purification procedures we had to see which had the least overlap in metabolomics of the compounds in each fraction to try and get the best separation of the secondary metabolites present. So we did all of this to evaluate all of the mechanisms. We finally came to decisions on what mechanisms to use, but then we had to automate everything. And so now we have to figure out how to do what we just did 150,000 times a year. So we need to provide sufficient material to support, as I mentioned, 20 screens a year for 20 years, uh, completed in five years. We needed 90% of the resulting fractions to contain greater than two milligrams and have at least 80% recovery of total mass. These all had to be lyophilized and weighed and kept in 10 uh, mil 2D barcoding tubes. And we needed to supply the library in set amounts in 384 well plates ready for screening, which would require the production of over 250,000 plates. And then also automated storage and retrieval of these. And we had to quality control everything because when you're moving at this speed with this amount of things, small mistakes early on can propagate to be large problems later. And so we had to build in quality control steps at each individual step. What we built was an automation lab uh, that can take extracts, prefractionate them, as I showed with that short movie on the previous slide, lyophilize those, weigh them, create screening plates, and store them in an automated repository. We've reduced this to practice at this point. Uh, to show you a little bit about reproducibility, this is, graph shows two different runs of 88 extracts that were done weeks apart. In run one and run two, we looked at the mass of each individual fraction and saw how they compared. And you can see they fall very close on this straight line of that graph, indicating that our prefraction met prefractionation methodology, as you can see in the lower left-hand picture and the robot uh, movie I had on the previous slide, is highly reproducible. And then below we see NCI 60, GI 50 data average for those as well. And though there is more scatter to this, you can see it also largely falls along those lines. And so we think that the uh, methods we have come to are highly reproducible. If we take a look at the type of compounds found, not the type or the number of compounds found in each fraction, we looked at it both by ELSD and mass spec, major and minor. And you can see they vary by the fraction, of course, and by the total, but somewhere in the range of 25 or so, 20 compounds per fraction is probably where we are on this when considering the major compounds per fraction. So at this point, we have already created 425,000 fractions from over 65,000 crude extracts. The first 150,000 fractions were plated on 384 old plates and began shipping in January of 2019. Uh, we also released an additional 175,000 fractions in January of 2020. We'll be releasing fractions again in January of 2021. I can't guarantee there'll be 175,000 as the pandemic has reduced our ability uh, to work as quickly as we'd liked. Uh, but I can say that at this point, we have already shipped more than 4 million samples to screening centers worldwide. And there has been a broad acceptance of this. And I show you on the right-hand side, this is our automated storage facility, um, which is on our uh, 
campus here at Fort Detrick. It stores 1.1 million 10 mil 2D barcoded tubes and has an automated retrieval unit where we can type in a list of 500 and it will retrieve them and, and spit those out to us in racks within a few hours. Uh, one thing I would like to mention here is that these Prefractionation technology methods are easily transferable to other research centers. We have done so repeatedly already. There are many groups that have been interested in adapting this. Uh, we've done so with the University of Michigan, the University of Mississippi and commercial organizations. And importantly, um, we've also been involved with working with the University of Pretoria in South Africa that has brought this technology on board and is in the process of prefractionating a 30,000 extract library of indigenous South African organisms. And I just heard from them this week um, as they are making so many fractions, they're running out of storage space, uh, but they've made good progress and feel that this method uh, is cheaper and more effective than other published methods. And one of our goals was to make this a type of technology that could be used by a variety of groups. Our hope is to continue improving the methodology and reducing the costs and also spreading this technology around the world. To give you an idea of who has requested the fractions for screening that we have produced, this is a partial list. It's not complete of all of the folks who have requested a material transfer agreement to receive the prefractionated extract library. Um, you can see there's a substantial number of academic institutions, both in the United States and elsewhere, as well as industry participation and US government participation. Importantly, we did want to make sure to get uh, other institutes and parts of the United States government to try and work with these so that they could uh, increase the acceptance and utility of natural products, as well as some of these companies to work with us and bring them back into their screening systems. So now that we've sent all these out to screen, people are gonna screen them. They're gonna get higher hit rates than they got with their pure compound libraries. They aren't gonna have a lot of natural products chemists in their groups because they aren't used to working with this. And so what are they gonna do? Well, one of the things we wanna do is increase the demand for natural products chemists. So we want them to be uh, happy with their screening results and want to work with natural products chemists. In some cases, we might send them uh, a list of natural products chemists in their area or encourage them to collaborate with local natural products chemists we know. In other cases, they want to work through a very high throughput manner to get to secondary compound uh, evaluation and to get to pure compounds. And so what we built was a highly automated second step of chromatography system to work with our fractions, to improve the speed and efficiency of HIP uh, confirmation by screening. So we needed, we felt, to get things back to screening labs in two weeks or less. We can't let them sit on their hands growing cells for two months waiting for things from us. And then we wanted to do this in a way that would add valuable chemical information to annotate the active samples, and then also reduce the costs of screening and reduce the use of the extracts. So in we do this in such a way that they would conserve the extracts themselves. And so we built a, a screening uh, secondary purification system, which I'll describe now. It starts out with a Gilson unit that you see here. And so it's a highly automated HPLC system in this case. And so each, uh, what we do is we take each fraction now and separate it into 22 mostly pure subfractions. One of these systems can purify 44 fractions overnight, 900 per run. At this point, we gather IR, UVMS, and proton NMR uh, is gathered and stored for all the active samples. And we can use multiple of these systems and process 500 hits within two weeks. So if we have a screening center that screens 150,000 fractions, they get a hit list of 500, they can send us that list. And within two weeks, we will send them dried down on 96 roll plates, approximately 11,000 sub fractions ready for screening and they can then turn around and screen those in their assay. This substantially reduces the fixed costs associated with screening natural products and greatly improves the efficiency. Also, I wanna point out, we're only using one milligram of a fraction, which only came from 250 milligrams of an extract. And so we are significantly conserving the amount of extract present. The natural products branch used to send out one to five to 10 grams of extract for people to work on. And so this allows us to save the majority of these extracts. 
So to do this properly, the first thing we had to do is make sure it's reproducible and scalable. So what we do is we run these standards that you see on the right every eight runs. Um, we inject standards and make sure that the chromatography is identical to what you see in uh, the panel A in this to make sure that that. And what you see in panel C is the reproducibility of the separation and area under curve of these standards. That way we know that if we do chromatography this week and then come back and do chromatography on the same fraction four months later, that we can expect to have identical chromatography done. If we see these standards differ in retention time by even half a minute, the column is swapped out and we replace it with a new column so that we can maintain the reproducibility. Also importantly is scalability. These columns are monolith C18 columns. And so what you see here in the graph are two, a small scale HPLC run and a scale up uh, with five times the amount of material put on. And what you can see is that the NMR looks almost identical. Our separation again fell in a single subfraction both times, uh, which is only a half a minute of collection time uh, with this run. And so we were able to evaluate and scale up rapidly. So instead of using uh, one instrument to run 44 different extracts overnight, I can now run 44 injections of five milligrams of, an, of a fraction of which we are particularly interested in and purify 200 milligrams in an automated fashion overnight. So if we take this and put this all together in a pilot project, we took 34 active fractions that we found in the NCI 60, did one milligram injections, got 836 subfractions. We then put that through mass spec, FTIR and proton NMR. Uh, to dereplicate and quickly identify compounds. We then were able to identify a total of 29 compounds, three of which were um, new natural products. And this was all done in less than a month. So these are some of the compounds that came out of that pilot program, uh, showing you the structural diversity thereof. We wanted to evaluate this structures of the compounds that came out of this screening and secondary purification paradigm. And so what we did is we took and analyzed them uh, using the chem GPS program. All of the compounds that were purified in this pilot program versus all approved natural product drugs from 1981 to 2010, which were in that particular database. And as you can see from the red dots, what we are finding and the type of compounds we're finding as far as their chemistry, their aromaticity, their sp3 carbons are right in the same region of approved drugs. So we feel we are hitting the sweet spot of what we desire to, to improve the likelihood of finding something useful out of these fractions. I would like to say we've also done multiple additional uh, pilot projects here with a variety of researchers, both inside the NCI and outside the NCI. Overall, what we see is that approximately 70 to 75% of the active components from the second stage purification can be identified at that level of purification. So when we make those 22 subfractions, about 70% of the time, those are pure compounds that we can rapidly identify. About 30%, 25 to 30% of the time, it requires additional purification. But the majority of those can be identified at that point. So these projects now, we've reduced the timeline significantly for chemists because we can rapidly, um, there are high throughput manners to get the IR, the NMR and the mass spec. And so we can automate that. And so we reduce the chemist time so that we can maximize the efficiency of the program. Again, as I mentioned about 70, greater than 70% of the active compound structures can be determined after the automated subfractionation. And this last one I think is perhaps the most important. What we're seeing across all the assays we've run now, and we've run several, is that about 80% of all of the fractions show activity when the crude extract did not. So what we're seeing is a fact that if you tested crude extracts, you would miss most of these activities, four fifths of them in fact, which is far too much. So to move quickly along, we had to build a, a high throughput a structural, excuse me, bioinformatic system this just shows NCI 60 data, and I'll move this quickly because I know time is at an essence here. 
Um, we have used self-organizing map technologies to analyze the 300 data points per NCI 60 sample tested and pattern match those into clusters. They end up in a map like this that you see of compounds showing similarity or dissimilarity from each other and potency. We can look at this. In this case, these are all the active extracts. It's about 4.8 million data points and it places extracts in biological space. This is very handy to be used because we can quickly look at metabolomics of extracts and see overlap. In this case, we can see the overlap in the center of these um, circles on the right-hand side, which indicated that crambicidins were active in all six of these extracts. But we can also take a look at something where we have two extracts at very different regions, though they're the same taxonomy. They show up in different regions of our self-organizing map, indicating a different biological activity. When we purify it, it turns out that though these are the same exact species of sponge, they have two significantly different compound classes responsible for the cytotoxicity. So using these bioinformatic methodologies improves the efficiency of our purifications. We have built this into an even bigger form that looks at all of our samples in chemical space. It can be parsed by assay, cell type, organisms. We are building wiki pages for, if you click on an individual hexagon in this map, it pulls up all the NCI60 data and all the structures of active compounds isolated. We are actually building wiki pages now for each individual extract that have all the information from the photograph of the organism, its location, how much was collected, how much was extracted, any compound activity and structures of those compounds, including the smile streams, and any biological activity, including in vitro and in vivo data. So we think that the NPNPD is transforming the way natural products research is performed here at the NCI and hopefully in other places as well. Uh, we are trying to create the world's largest and most chemically diverse natural product library in a ready to scream format for free and to enable better performance in drug discovery and conserving the biodiversity at the same time, which is priceless and empowering the extramural research community with a unique comprehensive natural products program that hopefully will meet a lot of the needs in the future. I'd like to thank all of the people who have worked on this project over the past few years. And I would like to thank you for your attention. If you need more detail, uh, we've published these three papers recently that detail the prefractionation methodology, the second stage purification methodology, and a review of screening adaptations for natural products. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barry. This was a very nice uh, short time presentation. Uh, on the, all what you've been doing. Uh, I must say that uh, we were very uh, happy and, and, and uh, privileged to have you uh, as a, a collaborator of the Biota program. You came over for some of our evaluation meetings and uh, I think a lot of the things that uh, we developed here uh, were also influenced by those uh, discussions we had in, in those meetings. Uh, so thank you, thank you very much. And uh, without further delay, uh, I'll give uh, the floor to uh, Iguatemi Costa uh, from Natura, uh, and he's going to talk uh, about bioprospection at Natura, biodiversity as a platform for innovation. But to me, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Indeed, fantastic presentations up to now and quite, quite happy to be invited here. So first of all, I'd like to, to thank all the organizers, especially Professor van der Leyen, Professor Leticia and Professor Carlos Jolie for, for this opportunity to share a bit of our experience on, on innovation based on our biodiversity, on Brazilian biodiversity. And I prepared here a very, very um, a brief presentation just to try to, to show you and to present you that how important it is the, the scientific um, discovery for a company like ours who work with phyto ingredients to produce cosmetics. And, and this, is, this is the way I, I prepare this, this presentation. So that the, the idea is to show to also show the, the, 
how a company deal with this knowledge, with this, this development, with this um, um, improvements like Biota FAPESP works with, with this kind of projects. And some examples of how this can be done and how beneficial it could be for both parts, for company and for academia, and as a consequence for the whole society and for the, the environment too. So I started uh, talking a bit about um, that Natura is now part of a biggest group that is called Natura & Co. Alongside with other companies like Avon, The Body Shop, and ASO. And as a group, we recently launched a vision, a sustainability vision, where biodiversity is one of the, the central pillars of, of this vision. So the, the relation with biodiversity as a, as a cosmetic company can, can do is, is one of the most important part of this vision. And of course, of the human being related with this biodiversity. But the, the history of Natura with biodiversity is not new. It comes for more than, from more than 20 years, almost the same age of Biota Fapes. And back at that time, the, the choice the company did was to use or, or to try to look at the Brazilian biodiversity as a platform of technology for our products. And well, since then we are, we are learning how to uh, move forward in this, in this agenda um, with this whole complexity that, in, that it's involved in this, in this agenda. Since the legal matters, meaning the, the access of biodiversity that we know it's, it was an, an, a question here in Brazil. But what, what an important point is that to develop or to undergo the projects related to biodiversity, we rely on good scientific studies about this, the same biodiversity. So every project in, in company or in academia starts with the uh, state of the art of the subject. So we need a lot of many different disciplines related to the, the work that Beata Fapesp is done, meaning since from, from ethnobotany, like Professor Van der Lange showed us, to ecological studies, passing through um, many other, you name it, many other disciplines that are quite important for us to move forward and, and to choose uh, a project that can be done, that can be um, finished in a, a new value chain for be used in the industry. So it's, it's multiple um, tasks, but it relies on a good science at the beginning and, and throughout all the projects of research. And well, since, since the beginning, we start with the principle of, of um, convention of biological diversity that is completely connected with the, the vision of Biota Fapest also, that the sustainable use of a, of a natural resource is, is a power, is a force to the conservation of it by creation of value of, on, on, on this, on this the same resource. And the truth is um, that it's impossible to, to value something that we don't know. So the spirit here and the idea here is to show that the same way as the, as the innovation status of, of a nation can be, it, it, it's, it's related, it's completely based on the good science it, it produces. I think this is quite under, understood that it's important, good scientific basis to have a good status of technological innovation at least. The same way if we are discussing a bioeconomy in a country like ours, biodiverse by definition, we need a good science in bioprospection. So the interaction of, of a company that works with the natural ingredients with the, the knowledge, the scientific knowledge produced is very, very important. So since many years, we started this platform that is called Natura Campus, that is done, that it was made 
to relate with the academia in a, many different ways since prizes. Um, recently, we and I and Professor Van der Ven had the opportunity to work with a prize of scientific recognition in a, in a product of Natura Campus that, that we work now um, alongside with, with CAPIS. But we, one, one instrument, one of the tools that we use for, for new projects was notices, meaning call from, for projects, a specific call for projects. So the first notice that we launched in Natura Campus was back in 2006. And one of the projects selected was called um, Project Mata Atlantica, led by Agronomic Institute of, of Campinas and was supported by FAPESP. And the whole idea, of course, was to understand the, the value of the species of Brazilian biodiversity, more, spe more specifically from the Atlantic forest. There's a, a very bio mega diverse biome of Brazil. And in the perspective of the company, the idea was to look for new opportunities, new essential oils that can be done, can, can be used in our perfumery and our exclusive perfumery. So this project um, um, started and six, as I, as I mentioned, it was a long time ago, but made undergo a lot of, of several expeditions, more than 10 expeditions, if I'm not wrong, but that was followed by, by, by 40 more expeditions just to um, uh, increase the knowledge of some species, to identify correctly, to understand uh, seasonal seasonality and other important things for, for the development of the, the, the whole project. And just to have a brief resume of this huge um, project, we had alongside of many other scientific uh, results, we could um, identify five high potential uh, ingredients for perfumery, completely new for, for use in perfumery. And then we started our uh, different journey in this case for domestication of the plants. And of course, to, to do all the other, um, other studies that is necessary to implement a new ingredient for this kind of, of, of industry. This is a, a good example of how can we have this double goal together to increase the knowledge of, of biodiversity and, and the potential use and also to, to have value, direct value for a company. And finally, we could launch these two projects as an example of the first uses of this, this new essential oil. It's one, one of the species, one species of paper that can be used um, successfully in these two launches. And now it's available for us as an, an ingredient for our perfumer to use to, compound, to, to create new ingredients. Uh, in our portfolio of products. And the same spirit here is another, it's a most recent one. In 2013, we started <clears throat> this new project with these new partners, in this case is um, uh, National Institute of Amazonian Research and Federal University of Amazonas. And the scientific idea here was to understand, is to, is to undergo, uh, is, to, is to do the, Floristic inventory of a region of a biological reserve of Watumã, there in the state of Amazonas, in the Amazon region, as well as to understand the chemistry of this ingredient. So the uh, Federal University of, of Amazonas, particularly, are inter were interested in this in the composition of, of some species of this. In our perspective, again, essential oils for perfumery. As you may notice, perfumery is one of a, a one of our main categories of products, and it's a multi-billion industry around the world. So Brazil is the second market for, for perfumery and for Natura is very important to, to develop. And we are very based, our innovation in perfumery is very based on the innovation and the ingredients, and then they are based in, in Brazilian biodiversity. So here are completely different um, um, situations, logistics, challenges, and everything. Here we have a different um, project, but the same 
success in terms of outcomes. So a lot of different essential oils, so many different uh, outcomes. And I will show you and share with you some of them. This one is, was a platform that was that now is used by, by INPA, by the National Institute of Research in Amazonia, Amazon in, uh, Research, that is used to uh, together all those you know, discovery of this project, but also that whole herbarium in, in, in it's open to to be to be used for the scientific uh, for the scientists in, in general. A completely new species was discovered inside this this, uh, this uh, project in the, the same umbrella of the project, a new anonase that was first um, reported. And the generation of a, um, a botanic key for the people of that region, in, again, from the, the biological um, reserve there. And of course, new, very in interesting ingredients for perfumery that we, we hope to, to put on the market in, uh, as soon as possible. We are now de developing new and continuing the, de the developing of these ingredients for, our, for us to use and put in the market. So this is this is the whole idea. I think that the time is, is short, but I think uh, I, I really would like that. That and I, I hope that that we, it was clear how important it is this knowledge, the, the importance of the knowledge for us to convert in innovation, and how important it is to bioprospection projects uh, if for evolution of agenda of conservation and also innovation in bioeconomy in a mega diverse country as, as ours. And the collaboration is an important path for, for us to follow this agenda. And thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Iguatimi. Uh, I think uh, you gave a very good idea of uh, the, the research that is developed by Natura and also in collaboration with uh, researchers in universities or research institutes. Uh, Tantura has a very long tradition of uh, using uh, natural uh, products for cosmetics. I think it's faster than it's for the pharmaceutical industry because the number of years that you have to test and, and, uh, and the difficulty of uh, all this tests are uh, uh, are lower than for uh, a new drug, uh, and uh, and you are using this uh, diversity in in its best way. I, I, uh, and also like to thank Natura for being uh, a partner of the Biota program for so many years. Uh, so now we start uh, the Q and answer uh, session. Are you both called to? Put your cameras on so that everybody is on the podium. Um, and uh, I will start with uh, a question that was made by Andreas Gombert from uh, the from Unicamp, uh, and he says that uh, it's very clear for us scientists the importance of biodiversity and the value of uh, ecosystem services. Uh, and the disastrous consequences of losing biodiversity and, and the services. Uh, and he, his question is how we uh, can work uh, with the society in general to bring this uh, notion or to reinforce this notion of the importance of the link between biodiversity and uh, the services. The question was made for Professor van der Laa. Uh, but uh, you may, you all may uh, give your opinions on that. So we start with Vandela. Okay. So how you can say it's very, I think it's very important. And uh, uh, I received some message now from Paulo Cesar Vieira. And at the beginning of the program or sub-program of Bioprospect, we discuss a lot. And that time, we, our idea should be similar to Barry showed us. But 
in the United States, you have NCI, that is the institutions. And now, when he mentioned the dimension and the importance of the NCI to have a very strong and powerful bioprospecting program that is not concentrated in the United States, but in the, in the NCI, you have extract of all over the world. I believe in the, next, the, last, uh, the last meeting that you have, only discuss a center for synthesis with Jean Le, Jean uh, and you, and all discuss a center of synthesis of biota. So if this is an institution, who knows? In Sao Paulo, because you have a very strong a structure in the University of Sao Paulo, you should have an institution that you concentrate uh, some, a program as you have the NCI. Because it's very hard to Brazil, that's continental country. We have so many groups working, but the, the way how we work is not organized because I think it's, a, a, it's, in, it's, in, it's concerning our <laughs> uh, culture. We need to be organized and to organize an institution to concentrate, even in Sao Paulo, that is completely different, to organize a very strong and robust institution to have uh, uh, all data of bioprospect you have done in Sao Paulo. I believe you needed to have an institution. And the beginning of the program, you discuss a lot of this, and now, when you celebrate 20 years and you, uh, you look, you have a glance in the future, maybe, who knows, we have to discuss with institutions in Sao Paulo, which could be the center of bioprospecting as you have in NCI. Uh, thank you, Bandela. I don't know if uh, Leticia very or but to me, if you want to, any of you want to comment on that question on how to to bring society uh, to understand the importance of uh, the relation between biodiversity and ecosystem services and the uses uh, we make from uh, uh, natural products. I think Iquatubi uh, has something to say. Yep. Go ahead. Yeah, well, uh, we are. We were discussing previously when we are preparing this this presentation about the, the role of teachers and professors. I think one one thing is education. Education is crucial for us to have the society on board on this agenda of the importance of services and environmental services. The importance of biodiversity per se, not only uh, connected with products, but I dare to believe that companies has this this work to 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 make it tangible to make it possible to understand uh, how this value so i i i dare to to think that companies has a role in in try to show the society uh, the importance of biodiversity this is my contribution to, to the question uh, for me, I guess, uh, from my point of view, I thought one of the most important things to improve uh, people's, uh, I would say, view and value of biodiversity and natural products was to get more people using them um, and to get them out there for, for everything. And so it used to be, for example, our repository was only for cancer research. And we changed that so now some of the people who are screening are screening for insecticides. Some people are screening for perhaps the cosmetic industry. Some people are screening for neurodegenerative diseases. Uh, and so I think the goal was to expand the number of people using natural products and testing them. And two things are important. One, opening it up to everyone and two, essentially giving them away. Um, anyone who wants the fractions only has to pay the cost of having them shipped to themselves. And I think to get back to Vanderlyn, you need an organization 
pretty much on a national level like the NCI to be able to make that initial investment in the infrastructure to do this, to provide these then to everybody for free so that they can use them. We still require the, you know, the material transfer agreements require the benefit sharing agreements to be signed. So anyone who receives these fractions has to agree to uh, benefit sharing agreements uh, in line with the uh, Nagoya protocol. And so they, that is required. But other than that, we, you know, it's impossible and no one should do natural products research without those requirements. But we think one, getting the most people involved for a variety of different uses that will eventually build increased demand and increased appreciation for the value of biodiversity. Uh, just a very quick comment, really. I think that we need to do a better job in educate. I agree with Iguatemi because you know that when you buy like a Natura shampoo, it comes from the diversity, but you don't know when you take uh, paclitaxel in the, for cancer treatment, most of the people don't know that it comes from a plant. So I think we should teach them to make this link. And on the other side, we have a, a huge responsibility that show people that use diversity for those purpose. It comes together with sustainability. We cannot allow to link the image of use diversity as whatever you want to put in the bioeconomy as some, somehow uh, adding destruction to the environment. So I think we have two responsibilities to build links that use that medicines come from the diversity and we should be responsible. I think this is something. That... Uh, okay, I have a second question also from uh, Andreas Gombert and it's directed to Barry. Uh, in general, which kind of useful compounds can be found in microbial extract, which do, no, do not show up in plant extracts, if there is any big difference in that? Well, I think you certainly have enhanced uh, non-ribosomal protein synthase enzymes and enhanced polyketide synthase pathways in microbial organisms that you don't see as often in plants. Uh, those compounds traditionally have been used as antibiotics or other components to that effect. I think that's where their greatest contributions have been made. But I think part of it could be also there are immune modulating things such as cyclosporin and other agents, the rapamycins, which have increased activities beyond just their initial um, immunologic test. And I think by modifying those, you'll increase uh, into a greater areas of human health uh, the contributions that microbial organisms can make. Thank you, Barry. Uh, I have myself a question to uh, Iguatemi Costa. Uh, it's been a long tradition in Natura uh, to use uh, products from uh, the Amazon forest. Uh, now, in your presentation, we saw that you are also you're starting to use uh, some uh, products from the Atlantic uh, forest. Is this uh, uh, it's going to be a new area to be explored by Natura? Very, very interesting question. And I, I think the Amazon is a, a question of, of focus, which is not a narrow focus because Amazon is huge and, and, and the opportunities are equally huge. But of course we are open and we have a lot of opportunities to, to look for uh, Brazilian biodiversity instead of some um, value chains that are outside of the country and not necessarily done in the, the best way. So to, to briefly answer, of course we have a focus on the Amazon region. We still have this focus on Amazon region, but we are clearly open to innovation in a broad way regarding to biodiversity. So this is, this is the point. We need to focus on something in, in order for us to, to even to follow up, to check our impact and everything like this. So th that's why Amazon is, is the focus, but always open for, for innovation and from biodiversity. Thank you. Uh, I have another question. This one is for Barry. Uh, I thought that uh, on that uh, sharing uh, the screening program that uh, you developed, 
uh, there were a list of uh, universities and also some companies, but there was uh, no Brazilian university of, or research institute. Any specific uh, particular reason for that, Gary? <laughs> well, um, we did not receive a request for them from any Brazilian research institution. I so. <laughs> we would be more than happy to send them to. And certainly we have memos of understanding, as you well know, with several different research institutions in Brazil. So I cannot say that they are not aware of this program even before this uh, talk today. So hopefully there will be some requests in the future. Well, uh, we have no more questions. So I would like to thank you all, uh, Vandelin and Leticia, for the presentation on what the Bioprospecta project has uh, done so far in terms of uh, the research and the achievements that we had. Uh, Professor uh, Barry uh, for the contribution on showing what the, so the new developments of the uh, natural products program at the NCII and uh, Iguatemi Costa for presenting uh, how uh, Natura is using the research that's produced by programs like the Biota and uh, doing research by itself. Uh, so thank you all. And I would also like to thank uh, the logistic uh, people behind you. Uh, this time, uh, Marcelo, Meletti, Vera Serin, uh, and uh, Gabriela Schmidt, uh, and uh, on the Biota side, Erika Speglish handling the question. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we call your attention that we are going to have uh, another uh, Biota webinar in, in a week time. So next uh, uh, Wednesday, uh, Wednesday 16th of September, we are going to have uh, our webinar that is dedicated to the advances uh, the Biota program made in research in coastal and marine areas. Uh, this would be uh, uh, an area that we uh, didn't have uh, too many projects in the first 10 years. It was identified as a lacuna when we did evaluation, uh, the 10 years evaluation, and uh, thereafter we made specific calls for project in this area, so we made quite a large progress and I, I'm sure it's going to be a very interesting uh, webinar. And then if you go to FAPESP's uh, homepage, you're going to find the list of the other webinars we are going to have uh, in the future. Uh, these are the addresses where you can get uh, the information. Uh, and I thank you all uh, for the audience. Uh, muito obrigado a todos que acompanharam este webinar. Eu lembro que na próxima quarta-feira, dia 16, teremos um webinar dedicado aos avanços feitos na área de pesquisa uh, uh, nas áreas costeiras e marinhas, que era uma lacuna que nós tínhamos no, no, no início do programa Biota e depois, com chamadas específicas, houve um grande avanço nessa área. Então, tenho certeza que será um webinar extremamente interessante e também uh, ir às páginas da FAPESP e do Biota, que aparecem na tela, uh, para informações nos demais webinars uh, que fazem parte desse ciclo de 20 anos de comemoração. Um bom dia para todos. Muito obrigado.